is electric. Good morning, everyone, and a very Merry Christmas to everyone. If you're watching this around the festive time of year, I just thought I'd film this around Christmas because it's actually the question that I'm asked the most on all of my videos, in all of the comments. It's what would I do if I was starting again? If I could make all these choices again, what would I choose and what would I do differently? All the technologies that I've bought. So it's whether it's solar panels, batteries, car chargers, uh, heating systems, all of those things. What would I do again if I had that time over? Now it's not about going back in time and going back to 2018, 2019 and making those decisions again at that time, because that would be a slightly different situation. I think it'd be better to say, what if I stripped everything away, got rid of everything electric that I've done now, what would I put back in right now? And that's more relevant, I think, for anyone else doing the same sort of projects now. So let's cover everything, every bit of technology that I've purchased, everything in the going electric journey. What would I do differently? What would I do again? Well, let's start with the first one. Let's start with solar panels. Right, so my experience with the physical solar panels is just JA Solar. They're the only ones that I've had experience of personally. But having thought about that, Everyone else's solar panels that they've installed, I know people that have had Jinko installed, Canadian Solar, Samsung, all sorts of technologies, and I haven't heard of a single one that's actually had solar panel problems. So, is there any, is there any concern about which actual panel manufacturer you use? I would probably stick with JA Solar because they're cheaper. They're cheaper than a lot of the other ones. Um, I don't think I'd go with those Sun Max Power ones, which brag about their extra um, efficiency and extra life and extra warranty and all those sort of things, because the price differential is quite significant. So for me, I don't have that premium of price to invest. Perhaps if I did, I would just go for the best all the time. But when you're on more of a budget, um, I think you have to go with a budget panel. So JA Solar have worked well for me, and I've used 280 watt panels, 300 watt panels, 330 watt panels, and 455 watt panels. So what would I do differently if I was starting again and still probably using JA Solar panels? Well, the first thing to say is I would take all the panels off the roof and I would start again. But how much more could I get on the roof? Because you think, oh, well, 280 watt panels, you know, that was back in the day. Now you can get three 400 watt panels of um, similar size. Well, you would think so, wouldn't you? But when I bought those original panels, they were probably around 17% efficiency. Now we're probably up to around 23% efficiency. Yes, you can get more, you can get better efficiency panels, but those are the premium panels. Remember what I'm buying isn't the latest and greatest tech today. It's like a generation lower where the price has come down and uh, the volumes have been shipped. So probably um, I would replace those 280 watt panels and 300 watt panels on my main roof with up to about 400 watt panels, I would imagine. But remember, they've only increased from 17 to 23% efficiency. So, Physical size wise, it depends on the rim size around the panels and uh, how big the panel is physically as to whether I could get more panels on the roof than I have now. I probably estimate that of the space we've got at the moment, which is taking up 6.3 kilowatts of solar panels. I think I could probably get seven kilowatts comfortably, maybe a fraction more, but I don't think I'd get much more because of that efficiency change. Panels haven't shrunk in size to get more watts. They've actually grown in size. And you've got to be careful with that because if you put a bigger panel on, you might have more leftover space that you can't fill with another panel. So probably I would be upgrading from 6.3 kilowatts to seven kilowatts on the main roof. So let's think about the inverters for that. At the moment, I've got two inverters, a Solus 3.68 kilowatt inverter because of my fit tariff. And also I've got a two kilowatt solar edge inverter. So what would I do with those two pieces of technology? Right, well, the 3.68 kilowatt inverter, I wouldn't necessarily need anymore because I wouldn't be going for a fit tariff right now if I was doing it again now. So there'd be no point in having the two different arrays that I've got. So I would go for a single inverter that covered all of them. 
So with seven kilowatts of solar panels, I would need at least a six kilowatt inverter. Um, ideally, it'd be nice if I could get above that, something that would max out above six kilowatts. Would I go for Solar Edge? No. That's the first thing that I would say has not worked for me and I would not go for. I have heard of people that have had Solar Edge failures, optimizer failures especially. Mine haven't, might have been as good as gold, but I did have a Solar Edge inverter failure on day one it was installed. So my personal experience has not been great with Solar Edge. Their software systems, I'm not a fan of them. They're sort of slick, but they're not advancing along with today's needs and today's requirements. And SolarEdge are extremely stubborn. They've recently announced software releases that have actually made the data that I'm seeing inaccurate. And yet they shout and they I mean, literally shout at me on the phone and have been quite aggressive in saying, no, we are correct. They even got to the point where they insisted that they could tell how much we were exporting, exporting from each inverter that we have with our separate solar generations, which is absolute rubbish. So you know, they are a very odd company when you come to software and how much they are controlled by the software. It seems as though the software company says, this is what we've got and this is the truth. And everyone else just has to line up behind them and make it happen. So my experience with SolarEdge has been quite poor uh, by comparison to the other technologies. So I would not install a SolarEdge inverter. I would not install optimizers because on my main south facing roof, we have so little shading throughout the year. There really is just no point of having that added complexity. Yes, we get some shading around November or December because of the low sun and some empty tree branches once the leaves have gone, but it's, it's so negligible. I, I can't see the point in optimizing that. So main roof, six plus kilowatt inverter. Would I go with Solace again? Um, probably because of my experience with Solace, I would stick with them and go with a Solace inverter. The only difference is I wouldn't go for a Wi-Fi dongle to connect to the internet and to connect to their servers. I would make that RJ45, so it's a more reliable connection. That's about the only change that I would make. But what about my other array? So that's two of the arrays handled. Well, I've got a third inverter, which covers three panels on my garage roof and four panels on my gable wall. So what would I change there? Would I still go for those gable panels? Why not? Um, they're four panels. It's uh, one, four panels of 455, so it's 1.8 kilowatts roughly of potential generation. I get a peak of about 1.1 kilowatts from them. So in the April, May, June, July time, I get really good generation from those with the low starting sun from the very east um, angle because they are east facing on the gable wall. So yes, it's extra generation, it's extra power, it's extra power first thing in the morning. They work very well for me. Of course, they're nowhere near as good as south facing. They're nowhere near as good as being higher up at a better angle on my roof. But if I didn't have them, I'd have less generation. So it's just more generation. More generation is a good thing. The thing that I'd be changing here is I wouldn't be putting scaffolding up three times to do my three arrays. It'd be going up once. So I'd be making a cost saving, doing it all in one go. So I wouldn't do this in stages, it would all be done in one go. So yes, I'd put those gable panels back up. Probably they'd be a little bit bigger than they are. Probably then instead of 455, they'd be 470, maybe even up to 500 watts today. But the bigger they are, sometimes the longer the panel, so I wouldn't go too far. And could I fill more space on it? Y yeah, I could probably get another couple of 300 watt panels above um, and slightly to the side. So I'll put a picture up now of how I might design that. But that might make that wall a bit more ugly. Yes, it's controversial enough having solar panels on a gable wall, but the way we've designed it, they look like framed boxes. From a distance, they almost look like blackened windows. Considering it's a blank red brick wall with some um, drain downpipes on, it's not an attractive wall in the first place. So in my opinion, the solar panels haven't made it worse. They've actually made it more attractive by filling the walls slightly. But if I over decorated it and put more panels up, I think I could make it look really, really weird. So yes, I would go for the panels. Yes, I would go for the same layout as they are. 
Um, slightly longer, slightly larger panels would be the only thing I'd go for. And I'd actually drop them from their positions by about two or three inches because they do fit slightly under the soffits. The installation for that just wasn't quite perfect. But such a minor change. That was all I would change differently for those. The garage panels are the only one really where I would do things a little bit different because I have noticed that the shade on the third panel, the top panel, is a bit more than I actually estimated. So because we get shade on that one, it does impact the output of the other two. So I would be better off optimizing that top third panel and leaving the other two as just um, single panels connected on an array. So that leaves me with a very interesting sort of challenging question. How would I connect them? What inverter would I go for? Because it, it's tempting to say, well, I could put them all, all of the panels everywhere on a solar edge inverter. But as I've learned um, with solar edge, they can't handle that difference between all of the panels on the house and then first thing in the morning, when just those four east facing gable panels light up, there isn't enough power to get the solar edge inverter going. It needs more startup power, so it's not very good in low light. It's not very good with a small number of panels connected. So thinking about the easy option would just be solar edge and optimize everything is a no for me. I would not go near that. So just strings everywhere apart from that garage. So what makes sense is one optimizer. What makes sense is a microinverter on that third panel on the top and uh, then stick as we are. The problem that I have with the garage panels and the gable panels is they're in two strings. So I need an inverter with two strings and I've got a Solus 2.5 kilowatt inverter, but I don't really need 2.5 kilowatts um, because my maximum output of the combined two um, sets of panels is about 1.4 kilowatts. So a 1.5 kilowatt inverter would be perfect, but <laughs> I can't have that because the 1.5 kilowatt inverters that are out there only have one MPPT, one string, that they don't have two. It's a kilowatt less potential power output. So when you put in your DNO notification for your G99 application, I currently have to say I've got a 2.5 kilowatt inverter even though the maximum it can have coming out of it is 1.4 kilowatts because the solar panels are split into two strings in two different directions. But that doesn't make any difference. So it's not about how much power I can output, it's theoretically with the inverters, how much power on paper could I output? That's what the DNO are interested in. So I'm currently at 8.4, something like that, kilowatts. But if I optimized that last inverter, so instead of a 2.5 kilowatt solution, I only went with a one kilowatt, 1.5 kilowatt solution, I'd be saving a kilowatt. So yes, less power that I'd have to apply for. But for me, I'd be adding more panels later. So that same DNO approval would get me more power and more panels uh, from the system. So that, that's one of the changes I'd be making. I'd be looking at optimizing that last array, which is 2.5 kilowatts with two strings. I'd be looking to match the inverter to the actual power output that I can do. So I'd be desperately trying to find um, 1.5 kilowatts to MPPTs and find a way of achieving that. But that brings me on to talking about the what ifs and maybes, because one of the things that I'd like to do is also install some direct DC solar on the Victron side of my battery. So I've got a Victron Multi Plus 2 inverter and that can have its own Victron um, smart MPPTs connected to it. So the solar panels connect DC from the panels directly into the DC side of the Victron inverter to charge the batteries. And then if the batteries are full, it then inverts the power out. So it's a hybrid solution. It's a um, DC coupled solution. And I've been anti, anti that because it sort of hides some of your solar. If I've got some DC connected and some AC connected, then it's very difficult to get a single CT to see all of the solar in one place. And I've really enjoyed being able to see it in one place. So there's a, there's a little bit of downside of connecting those Victron panels in that way. One of the ways of achieving all of the solar in one place is to not have any of these inverters at all and to go with Victron completely and have all of my solar connect through Victron. And do you know, I don't have enough experience of that right now to say, would I do that? 
but it's a tempting option to consider. So I'd get rid of my solace inverters, solar edge inverters, have none of them and have all of my panels connect through Victron MPPTs directly into the Victron inverter and then it would only invert out what it needed. But is that the right way to go? Would I not want some AC connected um, solar in there as well? Because the Victron inverter can have some AC connected solar. So that even in an off grid situation, you've got AC connected plus your DC connected, you've got them all together. It becomes quite complicated and it becomes quite a dilemma to say, what would I do? And because of that complexity and the fact that I'm sat here today and I really don't know which combinations I'd want to go for because I'd like to try them all from a point of view of testing. I'd love to try them all. But I know moving to a variety of different solutions would mean that I'd have a variety of different methods of obtaining how much solar energy have I got right now. And I like seeing it all in one place. So my gut feeling is it'd be all or nothing. It'd be all AC or all Victron connected. So at the moment, I'm talking about replacing inverters with inverters and carrying on the way we are. One of the challenges that I've got um, is if I put a six kilowatt inverter on the main roof and then I connected that to the um, protected circuits of the Victron side. So basically in a power cut, I would then have not only battery power, but I'd also have that six kilowatt inverter solar power as well. That would make more sense. But having said that, I haven't actually had a power cut here. We've had five power outages that lasted 30 seconds, a minute. Basically, I didn't notice we had any power outage. So it made no difference to me at all that the solar was not connected. It's not as if we're offline and off grid for multiple days and need the solar panels. So it's technically a luxury that would be nice to have some solar backup in an off grid situation, because then I could play at turning the grid off and pretending that we're uh, off grid and seeing how long I could last. I could do that. But it's not a real solution that I actually need. So, and the issue that I've got is my Victron inverter, the MultiPlus 48 5000, has 5000 VA capable inverting, and therefore I can't go more than 5000 <laughs> watts of power on the AC connected solar panels. And you think, okay, that's quite technical. What is all that about? Well, if I've got five kilowatts of solar coming in now. It's a really, really sunny day and my batteries are full and suddenly we go offline to the grid. So we don't have a grid. What happens to that five kilowatts of power? You've got five kilowatts that needs to go somewhere. So the inverter basically can dissipate it. It can make it disappear. Um, it can change its frequencies and whatever it, the clever stuff it does inside. And instead of putting it in the battery, instead of sending it to the grid, it can disappear it. Presumably it disappears into heat. But five kilowatts isn't what I'm talking. I'm talking about six kilowatts and I don't have that capability with that Victron inverter. So looking at which solar panels are available for off-grid potential makes more sense to put more of it through those DC connected panels. So that's, that's another thought process about going all Victron MPPTs, because then I get it all in an off-grid situation as well. It's a nice plus. But at the moment, I'm gonna stick with, I would be going for a six to seven kilowatt inverter, AC connected for the main panels. And if I could find it, a 1.5 kilowatt inverter with two MPPTs for the two strings, the garage panels and the gable panels, with the one panel with its own micro inverter, just to improve that shading. That's the optimal solution. If I had to go for more microinverters for the garage and a single MPPT for the gable panel, then I'm starting to have the same issue about expanding the amount of kilowatts of inverter potential power that I have, a kilowatt for the garage panels and a kilowatt for the um, gable panels, but I'm only ever going to output a maximum of 1.4, so I'm losing some of the potential of my DNO approval. The way I could get around that is the Victron MPPTs because they go into the Victron side and that can be limited on what you can export. So once it's controlled and limited, then it's a software controlled limit on the power output and that would be better for the DNO approval. 
So yeah, it, everything points towards some of my solar panels would need to go as Victron MPPTs and go into the DC side, and then I would optimize my DNO approval. But of course, DNO approval, what would I do? Well, I'd at least to start with, put um, a request in to see how much I could get. So I would add a couple more kilowatts somewhere and see whether I could get instead of 8.4 or whatever it is that I've currently got, see if I can get 9.4, 10.4, see how much I could actually get. And uh, yeah, then try to optimize it. Right, so that's extra panels. The one thing that I considered versus putting the gable panels on was to put some garden mounted, ground mounted panels on. Um, I also considered putting some north facing panels. So that'd be a quick decision. Would I go for north facing panels? The answer is no, because ours are directly north and the shape of the roof is quite steep and uh, we get a lot more moss on that side. So basically, because I don't get any power at all in the winter and it's all about summer generation, and there's some shading from our chimney stack, which makes it more complicated or reduces the output. And then the cleaning with all the extra moss that's on that side, I, I wouldn't touch the north side, but ground mounted panels, that I would do. And I am looking at uh, installing between two and four ground mounted panels. I, I mean, I'd love to put it on a Heliomotion tracking uh, mount in the back of the garden, that would be nice. But probably just two mounted at the end of the garden and two mounted in front of it, just slightly forward. 400 watt panels, so about 1.6 kilowatts extra is what I would look to finalize our solution and make it absolutely perfect. So if I was starting again, that's what I'd be doing. Adding a few more panels to the main roof, optimizing the uh, garage roof panel, just that little bit extra and installing up to 1.6 kilowatts of ground mounted panels. So if that's solar out of the way, what about the battery storage? What would I do differently there? And basically it would stay the same as it is. Um, the only one change that I would make with the battery storage is I would install just a little bit more and I put it in a second cabinet. So I've got two strings of batteries in two separate cabinets, but I like the modular nature of the Pylon Tech batteries. I've had no issue with them at all. Um, they're cheap to buy, cheap to add to by comparison to other systems, and they work really well. So Pylon Tech separating the battery tech from the actual inverter tech. I like doing that as well. I like the modular nature of doing this rather than all in one solutions like Give Energy or Tesla. Um, I'm glad I didn't go with the Tesla solution because of all the issues about their automation, about Stormwatch and stuff like that, which might be appropriate for some countries, but um, it's not really technology that I'm interested in. And it would frustrate the hell out of me if my batteries weren't charged overnight because the system had decided not to. I like to have control. So for me, the Victron inverter is still a no brainer. Um, I would not go with the MultiPlus 48 I would probably try to increase that slightly because we're talking about what would I do in an optimal thing? You know, how, what would I do if I could start again? And uh, <laughs> I don't know, almost money is no object, etc. So probably I would go for a Quattro 8000. Um, so increase the power capability and go for a Quattro, not a Multi Plus. The reason for that is the Quattro um, is a little bit quieter. Um, I chose the Multi Plus because it has a lower standby power and lower power output um, to run the physical device. So that made sense at the time, but having heard the fans on the Multi Plus 5000, I would probably go for the Quattro instead, and that would improve my solution, plus higher charging speed, plus also higher output. So a Quattro 8000 is what I would install if I was doing it again. But Victron is just the perfect um, battery inverter because of the software. It gives you open access to the data. You can integrate it with things like Home Assistant and other uh, open technologies. All of the data is there, it's very modular, but it's how Victron do their software updates. They've been doing it for decades. You know, they, they do it in marine solutions, they do it in off-grid solutions. They are extremely experienced and their software upgrades just work, they're seamless. So you know, I haven't got this issue about they go to fix one thing and then something else breaks with you know some of the some of the systems that I've seen with more, shall we call them startup companies, their software is a bit more fragile. Victron, you can see what you're getting and you can see how it works and they do update the software and you do get good updates coming along. My only concern when I went with Victron was the ability to control the battery for um, grid demand and flexibility services. So me dumping the battery out to the grid and deciding when to do that. 
But the more I looked, the more I found that there were lots of easy manual ways of doing it. And I do it sort of part automated and part manual. So I've configured some buttons on Home Assistant that I can just press the one button and it suddenly exports 4.5 kilowatts. That's pretty fast for me and pretty convenient. And it makes a lot of sense, but I can also automate that and have that automated completely. So that capability is very good. Where a lot of other systems with batteries, they handle the automation about connecting to Octopus Energy and do those things, which means you're limited by what their automation is. I like the Victron solution so that I'm not limited by any solution or any system. If a different energy company did things in a different way, I could still adjust and work with that, where some other battery systems are only sort of stuck with Octopus until they redevelop and do other things. So for me, Victron just makes sense. The modular nature makes sense. So I've got batteries separated from the inverter. And my experience has been excellent with Victron. Um, that combination of being able to solve things yourself by looking online and finding out how they work and handle it yourself versus uh, getting some actual support online and finding out how things are done. The, the only problem with Victron is finding an installer to actually do it. That's, that's the only problem with going with Victron. But for me, once you've got through that hurdle and you've gone through that, you've ended up getting a, getting a better system. And remember, these are gonna last 10, 20, 25 plus years. So you need something rock solid. You need something that's rock solid, both hardware wise and software. And that's why, again, you know, I would go with Victron and keep hold of that. Because if something went wrong with the batteries, they're modular, I could swap some out or I could even change the battery technology. I wouldn't have to change the inverters. Size-wise, what have I got at the moment? 17 and a half kilowatt hours in total, 14.4, 14.5 usable. I'd probably add another five kilowatt hours, another US 5,000 batteries, probably the limit of what I would go for. I just don't need any more. I mean, I'm not getting near the bottom of our battery capacity now, so I really don't need much more. So that's what I would go for. Let's quickly go through some, some other tech then electric cars. What would I do differently? Well, if I could go back in time, I would sell the Golf and sell the Mini back in October last year and uh, have sold them for a premium, go without a car for a few months, wait until the price is absolutely plummet, and then I would basically buy them back again. Um, I, I would buy what we've got. I would buy the Soul and I would buy the Mini. Um, at the moment, I'm very happy with my Mini. Um, and at the moment, my wife is extremely happy. She, she's over the moon with her Kia e -Soul. So car-wise, we are where I would ideally want to be. I wouldn't choose anything else. Yes, there are nicer cars. In a dream world, I'd have a Porsche Taycan uh, across Turismo, but um, the efficiency and the price on that just makes it completely impractical uh, to have right now. Other than that, there's no other car that I'd be interested in. The Jaguar I-Pace is appealing, but it's just so, so big. I wouldn't get the pleasure from driving it and knowing that Susan can or can't drive it, and that's where the Kia e -Soul really fits, because it, it's a great car, it's a great electric car, it's really comfortable, it suits the practicality of what she wants. She doesn't want a finery of a Jaguar I-Pace or a Porsche Cross Turismo. Um, that's just my desire of you know, the old petrol head Nigel wanting a flash car. But my common sense head says at the moment we've got the perfect solution. The e -Soul for the distance and the Mini for the fun. Car charger wise, the Zappi. Now that's a really interesting one because although the technology is excellent and I'm happy with the Zappi and I've done really well from it, etc. It has been a frustrating process. But if I'm not going back in time and starting afresh, and if I'm buying right now, then a lot of that has disappeared because the software is now a lot better. It's a lot more stable. It works really well. And the Zappi integration to Octopus Energy is absolutely excellent. That's the right way to go. You don't want to go with an integration of the car handling the charge. Um, that's a bit more flaky. It's much better to have the charger do it. So my choice would either be between Ohm or that's O-H-M-E, or I would be going for the Zappi again. And I, I think I would be going still Zappi. But the one that's the real questionable one is now we are where we are and I'm on an export tariff or I'm paid 15 pence a kilowatt hour to export energy, then I'm not in such a hurry to consume that energy. Um, it's probably more practical to charge everything overnight at cheap rates, seven and a half pence, and export everything during the day at 15 pence. I can actually make a profit on it. So I'm, uh, 
Heating my hot water with a solar diverter during the day is wasting seven and a half pence per kilowatt hour. But I do like hot water topped up continuously during the day from solar. So a solar diverter is the hard one because financially it would say, no, it doesn't make sense to have it anymore because of the current situation that I'm in. But who's to say this export situation and the price that we're paid for export is going to stay? So I am going to want a solution where I can flexibly do what I've done before and do what I'm doing now. So one moment I might want to export all my energy, one moment I want, might want to consume all my energy. So yep, in hindsight, talked around it, I would still go with a solar diverter and I would still stay with an eddy. Because I think, again, that solution on balancing between the Eddy and the Zappi and uh, the smartness between them, I really like it and I like the software. I like the openness of the software that I can get all access to everything I want through Home Assistant again. And then hiding in the garage amongst all my rubbish and next to this redundant oil boiler. The Mixergy hot water tank. I've got to say, this is... This is the odd one to talk about because I think my video was a little bit too negative towards Mixergy at the time that I put the video out and it stood the test of time. I've actually been really, really happy with this device, so much so that it's just, it's one of the only devices I've got that I really just leave alone and don't touch. And it's because I don't use hardly any of the features because I've got this third party solar diverter PV switch down there. Uh, and I use the eddy to heat it. I don't really use it. I don't use this control panel here to boost where I can just ask for more hot water on this little remote control. And I, I don't use the AI side of things, but it just works and it's very clever. And I haven't had as good hot water um, with any hot water system that I've had before. Um, it just really is good. It's, it's more instantaneous. It uses less energy. It just does the job. And yeah, I'm very, very happy with this Mixergy hot water tank. So I would go for exactly the same and exactly the same size. I could I could get away with an even smaller tank than this one. I think I dropped from 180 litres to 150. I could get away with less. But if we ever install a nice new bath in our bathroom, I'm probably going to want those 150 litres to fill up a nice bath. So Home Assistant technology, yep, I would stick with that as well. That has been a revelation, uh, and I really do enjoy using that technology. Home Assistant-wise, just talking about that quickly, about the only change that I would make on Home Assistant is the temperature sensors. Um, I went with so many Sonoff Zigbee um, battery-powered temperature sensors to go along with a Sonoff gateway that um, I've had issues with the Sonoff ones and the Acara, A-Q-A-R-A, -A, that brand of Zigbee temperature sensors are as equally compatible with the Sonoff gateway, but I've had hardly any um, of those going unavailable and the battery power lasts longer on them and they connect faster. They're, they're just a better device and more expensive. I was trying to save some money going with Sonoff, not Acara. And uh, yeah, if I was doing it again, I wouldn't go with the Sonoff temperature sensors. I would just go with a Cara. But other than that, I'm happy with everything that we've done so far. All of the smart devices here in the house, the smart lights, the outside lights especially are brilliant. Um, I really like those. The kitchen lights that we've got in here, they are excellent. So I like all of those. And then we've got a mixture of Casa and Tapo bulbs around the house. Probably that mixture isn't ideal. And over time, the Casa ones now aren't available. I can't buy the Casa ones. So in hindsight, probably Tapo would be the way to go. So we're getting through just about everything. So you know the cars I would change, the solar panels, the batteries, the home assistant, all of the technology we've got here. That leaves heating. What would I do differently with heating? And basically, I would not go for a wet radiator system heat pump. I'm very, very happy with our air-to-air, -air, so I would stick with that. Would I drop the power output of our um, inverter outside? Because it's eight kilowatts. Would I go to a six kilowatts? And that'd be the tempting one. And I think I would. I think I would go for a smaller, lighter, less powerful six kilowatt inverter outside and then have the same units that we've got inside. So basically it would take longer to power them up. But on idle, it would run even, even lower than what we're currently running. So the eight kilowatt is excellent. Um, but I, th I think the six would be just what we want. 
The question mark over what we've got is, what would I do in my bathrooms? And I think I've now found the perfect solution for the bathrooms, and that's a combination of infrared and the immersions in the radiator. I like a small immersion in the radiators, which acts as a towel rail, and being a small wattage means you're not worried about how long they're on for. Um, I really like the cloakroom one that basically goes on and off all day, but it's off as much time as it's on, once it's at temperature. And that heats the towels up absolutely perfectly. And then the combination of using the infrared panel uh, with that means that that's enough power to actually heat the room. So I would go for all of our wet rooms with an infrared panel, mirror panel, and also um, a towel rail immersion heater as well in all of them. Where at the moment I've only got immersions in two of the bathrooms and I've only got uh, the infrared panel in one. So that would be the change I'd make. I'd add infrared panels to the other bathrooms. That's what I'm going to plan to do. And that would give me a very flexible, very low power solution. It would give me dry towels and it would give me warm, hot bathrooms, um, overpower them slightly. And I think that's the mistake I made to start with. I underpowered things. The, the immersion in our ensuite is 300 watts, the same as the downstairs cloakroom, and it's not powerful enough. So I would up that to 500 watts. So just increase them slightly uh, on the upstairs radiators, towel rail radiators that are bigger. They need to be 500 watts, not 300 watts. Would I put heating systems in the other rooms that I don't have? For example, this kitchen does not have a radiator. The radiator used to be here from the uh, oil boiler central heating system. That's been taken out as part of the kitchen refurb. We don't have a heater in here at all. Um, when we do need some heat, we use a portable fan heater, can you believe, just sat underneath this table, and that works perfectly well. But long term, if we wanted more heat in this room and we wanted to use this room more in really cold conditions in uh, January, February, uh, etc., those sort of times, then probably on the wall up here above me would be the perfect place to put one of those bar heaters, um, infrared heaters. So that's probably what I'd go for. I've got electric sockets on the wall already quite close by and a nice slim infrared, not panel, but bar system um, up there would be the perfect solution for it. So I've got flexibility for adding that into our heating solution if I want. I still like a heating system that is a mixture of devices. So I've got air to air, I've got immersions in radiators and I've got infrared panels. I like that mixture of systems because if your boiler fails and you've got no heating, it's pretty much a pain in the bum. But if I have one of my units fail on air conditioning, I've got several others that are working. If the inverter outside fails, then at least my bathrooms have all got heating in them. And I'd use um, separate systems like this uh, fan heater underneath to warm us up as well. So I, I like the contingency of having a modular system for our heating as well. Uh, it, it doesn't bother me at all that we don't just turn a thermostat and then the whole house goes to the same temperature. I don't actually like that sort of solution. Um, to me, it makes no sense. And then I wouldn't want to go around and adjust thermostats for different rooms for what we wanted on and off, because that's no different to what I've got. If I've got to adjust thermostats online on an app or physically, then that's no different to me adjusting schedules of separate devices on smart plugs, etc. So I'm very happy with our solution, our modular solution, and it is extremely efficient. I really like the heat output we get from our system, and I like the um, speed at which we can go from a cold house to a warm house. So I like that flexibility of the air-to-air -air system, plus, of course, air conditioning in the summer. How could I forget that? How, how could I contemplate going for a wet radiator heat pump system with no air conditioning? I'd have to install air conditioning as well. So it'd be a much more expensive system. Um, it'd be using more energy in my mind because we'd have the heating on more, we'd be heating more of the rooms. Just does not make sense. And we'd be changing all the radiators, increasing them. And I don't want radiators, you know, like in here. This radiator is in the way. I couldn't have this cabinet that I've got here, um, which makes this kitchen, it's beautiful. A nice piece of solid oak rather than a horrible white radiator. So um, yeah, radiators, are going throughout this house and uh, I'm much happier with the heating solution. Air to air, so all of the units rise up and a mixture of immersions and infrared. There you go, that's it. That's what I would do technology-wise of everything we've got. So absolutely, would I go electric still? Yes. Would I stick with diesel and petrol and oil heating? Absolutely no. Moving across to electric, everything has been the best thing I ever did and my strategy of 
generate my own power for energy independence and consume as much of it as I can, have some good storage to last on the winter days and if there are any power cuts so we can keep on cheap rate power through Octopus Energy. That has been just a revelation. The, the size of our heating bills, we're talking, I think it was under £400, wasn't it? I'm going to do this off the top of my head. Under £400 last year is what we spent for all of our energy. So for our heating, for charging our electric cars, for running the house, everything, £400, including um, the standing charge. I mean, that is ridiculous. That's what a lot of people, uh, my daughter's one of them, she spends that per month, which is, you know, from what I can see, ridiculous when there are better options available. So your strategy's got to be flexibility, flexibility of using energy when you want to use it and when it's cheapest. So the trick with all of these things, you've got to get that cheap rate. So you need an electric car because they're electric car rates typically that get the really cheap rates. And then you need battery storage to store it. And you need flexibility when you use your energy so that you can keep away from those peak rates at four, five, six o'clock at night, etc. That's got to be the key. And that's what's worked best for us. We, you know, I absolutely love having low energy bills, not just because I can go, you know, ha ha, we've got low energy bills to everyone else. It's a case of while the world's going crazy and while people are worried about inflation and energy crisis and uh, the climate and all those sort of things, here I am generating our own energy, using our own energy, paying very little for energy elsewhere. And I'm very comfortable. So we're warm, we're mobile, we're flexible, and we're not afraid of energy price increases, etc. or what goes on in the world energy-wise. We've got our independence. The only thing I haven't really catered for is that off-grid capability. If the world goes crazy and we're off completely, I'd have to do some rewiring of our system to have that solar off-grid, which I've talked about already. So there you go. That's what I would do differently. A lot of it very similar to what I've done. I think I've made some very good decisions here. Um, I hope you've made some good decisions as well and don't regret them. There's nothing worse than installing solar or batteries or buying electric cars and then regretting it afterwards. And that's why it's really good to follow channels like this one to see what we've done and why we've done it and then make your own decision. It doesn't have to be the same because what suits me might not suit you. You might not be such a data geek as me. You might not be such a control freak as me as wanting to be in control of these systems. So different solutions definitely might suit different people. Anyway, thank you so much for listening. Uh, it's a really long video. Thank you so much for watching my videos throughout the year and subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. The EV Puzzle is a great channel going forward and the electric journey is a, it's a good documented journey about going electric for everything. And I think that's going to stand the test of time because even now people are still watching my old original videos, even though they're not quite relevant um, to what's available now they're still relevant to the consideration of what to do. So uh, I've really enjoyed the journey. Thanks for coming along with me as well. It's not over yet, that's for certain. Take care, see you again soon for more great videos coming soon. Merry Christmas everyone and a happy new year. Bye for now.